I'd like to thank the Cayman Heart Fund for the invitation and all of the sponsors, particularly Baptist Health, for bringing me here. I normally do speak on uh, women and heart disease, so uh, I was asked to speak on stroke. Uh, my talk today will be on uh, how we're treating stroke uh, more recently uh, and uh, what are some of the latest trends in, in treating uh, stroke. So I've uh, come to think of it, since I normally talk about heart attacks, I've come to think of it as a brain attack. So we're just going to head north a little bit. So stroke is a worldwide disease. There are 750,000 new strokes in the United States, uh, 1.2 million new strokes in China every year. It was the third leading cause of death, it's now number five. But in so far as more people are living through their strokes, it has become the leading cause of disability. And the cost of care plus the loss of productivity is over $56 billion annually. It's an important disease. So uh, we have different stroke types. Ischemic strokes are by far the largest proportion, uh, followed by hemorrhagic strokes. And uh, how we treat them, uh, as we'll see today, has, it can be a little bit different. Um, so time is brain, just like we say in heart disease, time is muscle. In each minute that your brain is not being perfused, you lose 1.9 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, 12 kilometers of myelinated fibers. And what does that mean? That for every 30 minutes in delay and reperfusion corresponds to a 10% less chance of a good outcome. So we have to move very quickly in stroke care. Current stroke options that are being employed today include intravenous TPA, and it should say endovascular neurointerventions, which include intraarterial TPA, and new, newer than that are the stent retrievers that uh, we'll talk about shortly in um, leading to reperfusion, all with that same goal in mind of reperfusing the brain. So for IV TPA, we've been using it for a long time, but there's been an increase in the last few years in emphasizing uh, its use and getting patients with patient education to come into the emergency department as soon as they uh, detect that they have a symptom that might be uh, a stroke or that a family member notices in a patient that they uh, are, might be having a stroke so that we can, because there's much more emphasis on utilizing uh, IVTPA. It really wasn't that long ago where a lot of the, in a lot of centers, including um, hospitals where I've worked, uh, the neurologists were uh, looking to have an exclusion criteria for giving TPA. So they were looking for any excuse not to give it. Now we're really emphasizing getting it on board and uh, getting it on board as quickly as possible. So the inclusion criteria are uh, symptom onset less than three hours before beginning treatment in most patients. And just the diagnosis of ischemic stroke causing neurologic deficit. And in that same spirit of emphasizing utilizing TPA and no longer trying to find excuses not to, you'll find that in some centers uh, there's much more uh, aggressive emphasis on it to the point where neurologists are even willing to uh, utilize IV TPA in those patients that might be having a stroke mimic like a, uh, a, a migraine, uh, a complicated migraine. Uh, because the thought process is now that if it's a stroke, we need to get treated right away. But if it's not a stroke, the risk of TPA causing a bleed in a patient who's not actually having a large stroke is so small that it's worth giving that patient, particularly a young patient who you know, maybe has lupus or some other hypercoagulable state that you didn't know, and you may have thought in the past, well, that's probably a complicated migraine, and now we're really pushing treating those patients as quickly as possible. 
and utilizing it in those patients who are 18 years and older and in those patients with, for, uh, with whom we've discussed the risks and benefits with them or their family. And the reason I put that up there is because we're no longer requiring that patients sign consent. We don't need a written consent anymore. Uh, and you can imagine that if you have a patient who comes in and uh, they're phasic or they're having a speech deficit or some other uh, problem where it's, it's uh, they're, they're consciousness is impaired, it was always a problem getting a consent. Uh, and family is not always with them, or the next of kin is not always there, the person who could give consent. And so that was always one of those things that slowed uh, the onset of giving TPA. And with patients who are within that three-hour window, it's considered the standard of care now so that we're not requiring written consent, just in your chart, it should document that you did discuss the risks and benefits. The, there is a uh, subset of patients who we can give TPA to within a four, point, four and a half hour window, and that went in an extended window. And those patients are, uh, that fit that criteria are less than 80 years old. They have no prior history of a combination of stroke, of prior stroke and diabetes. They're not taking warfarin or any other novel anticoagulant. And you know those patients who are in the three-hour window, even if they were taking uh, Coumadin, uh, they could get TPA if their INR is 1.7 or less, or less than 1.7. Uh, for those patients that you would consider putting in that 4.5 window, 4.5 hour window, it doesn't matter what their INR is, even if they're not therapeutic, if they're taking Coumadin, they don't qualify for the 4.5 hour window. Also, these patients need to have an NIH stroke scale less than 25, which would suggest a, a smaller um, infarction. And in these patients, you do need to get written consent. Lots of uh, TPA exclusion criteria, and as I mentioned, they were always kind of used to um, try to not use TPA. Most of them involve either prior, uh, involve bleeding. That's the primary risk. So people who would be at risk of bleeding who had prior trauma, prior surgery, uh, prior hemorrhage uh, in the brain, have some bleeding diathesis. Uh, Platelet counts less than 100,000, INR greater than 1.7. Certainly, um, glucose uh, as hypoglycemia can be also one of those mimics. Um, so usually we do a finger stick so that we know that information right away. And we're not waiting for laboratory uh, results anymore in, in the emergency department when patients come in and uh, they have stroke symptoms. If we find once the labs come back that a patient has a platelet count less than 100,000, we'll stop the infusion, but we're, not, we're no longer waiting. There's really an uh, emphasis on getting the TPA in in less than an hour, and now our goal is actually less than 45 minutes from the time the patient walks in to the time that the infusion starts to, uh, that bolus is started. Uh, looking for CT demonstration of a, a large infarct would be a contraindication because that would be uh, the patient who would be likely to bleed. And uncontrolled hypertension. And in that, we're really looking at those patients who you can't control their blood pressure while they're in the emergency department. So most of us, um, while we have protocols that typically have us giving labetalol in multi doses to control the blood pressure because of the, the idea of getting the pressure under control so that we can give the drug as soon as possible. Most of us are, are going to cardine despite the fact that our, our uh, evidence based protocols that also uh, consider cost issues uh, have labetalol as the, the primary uh, starting point. So, um, at Baptist Health, we're part of the Stroke Consortium uh, with Miami-Dade County Fire Rescue, and they have identified those hospitals, those centers that are either primary care stroke centers or 
comprehensive stroke centers so that in the field, they're deciding where they take the patients. So they're only taking patients who show symptoms of stroke to those hospitals that have been able to demonstrate that they can get TPA on board in the appropriate amount of time. Or if the patient is outside of the TPA window or has a very, uh, what appears to be a large vessel stroke um, as indicated by a very high NIH stroke scale, those patients may need to go directly to a uh, comprehensive stroke center. So at the hospital where I work, we're a primary stroke center, which means that we have direct communication with EMS. They call us when they are bringing in a patient with stroke symptoms, and at the time that we get that call, we're calling our neurologist so that they're on their way in. We're calling our neuroradiologist so that they know to uh, be where they can read the CT scan. We're calling the CAT scan tech so that they are aware that a patient is coming. We're calling the EDP, the, the emergency department physician overhead, so that they know they're going to be standing there waiting for the patient to um, come by on the gurney. And EMS is taking that patient directly to CAT scan so that there's really no delay. All of our evaluation is done right there in the CAT scan room. So um, again, the, it, to qualify as a primary stroke center, you have to have these processes in place that are uh, dedicated to ensuring that your door-to-needle time is as soon as possible, but no greater than 60 minutes. And again, that time is actually changing to 45 minutes and that you also have a seamless transfer to a comprehensive stroke center. So, you know, we have that process in place as well so that if a patient is going to need the services of an endovascular uh, doctor, and we'll talk about uh, what those services include in a few minutes, we can get them as quickly as possible to those services and that 24-7 we have a, both a neurologist and a neurosurgeon um, available. And for a comprehensive stroke center, you have to have all those same things that uh, are required for a primary stroke center, but in addition, you need 24-7 uh, availability of a neuro uh, interventional physician uh, who, to, who can do endovascular procedures. And both of them require that we have continuous data collection, process improvement uh, processes going on. So I want to talk about um, large artery occlusion strokes because um, although we give IV TPA for those patients, we also know that they don't do particularly well with IV TPA alone. And those are the patients that are really benefiting from the services that uh, we have at a comprehensive stroke center with those endovascular um, services that are available. So this is what we're talking about. Here's a blood vessel that's occluded right at the MCA here. You can see this resulted in a large MCA stroke. And this patient even had a lot of the large swelling that goes along with an MCA stroke and required a, a craniotomy there, craniectomy. So large vessel strokes typically have very high NIH stroke scales, sometimes uh, at, at greater than 17, um, which carries a very poor prognosis. And they're associated with the malignant MCA syndrome, like the picture of that patient we saw with the swelling and uh, has an 80% mortality. The internal carotid artery T occlusion is 73% mortality, and only 3% of those patients end up with a modified Rankine scale of less than two. So only 3% of those patients with that type of a lesion, that type of a, a stroke, will end up with an independent lifestyle. And with vascular occlusions, the 70 to 90 percent mortality. So, you know, without doing some type of intervention, it's a very grim prognosis for these patients. And looking at the NIH stroke scale, you can see to have a uh, NIH stroke scale of 17 or greater, there's a lot of systems that are uh, are affected uh, because you, for any one, the most you can get is three points. 
so or four if if you're talking about motor movement. So you know these are patients who are really greatly affected uh, by have have uh, large neurologic deficits. So what are we doing? Basically, it's like a heart catheterization, except you know it starts at the groin and instead of turning left and going down into the heart, you turn right and go up into the brain. And it's really quite amazing. They are going up with a wire and deploying stents and uh, sucking out the clot. So you can see this is when they, the stent was here and they got reperfusion, uh, sucked out the clot and got reperfusion. And this is exact, this is a cartoon of, of what goes in. Have the wire, the stent gets, the wire crosses the clot, the stent gets deployed and it just gets sucked into this mesh. And there's the clot. And reperfusion is the most important independent risk factor or, or predictor of a good outcome. So if we don't reperfuse the brain, the patient is not going to do well with a large vessel occlusion. So revascularization is the hallmark of a good outcome as well as having a relatively low baseline NIH stroke scale and of course younger patients tend to do better. Failure to revascularize is the number one cause of mortality in these large vessel strokes along with the NIH, high NIH stroke scale and an age and also an internal carotid artery occlusion that's not revascularized carries with it a very high risk of mortality. So what evidence do we have that this is working. So this was a, a product that was out when I was a little girl. I don't know if they still make Mr. Clean, but that's where they got the name for the study. So they're cleaning up the arteries. The multicenter randomized clinical trial of endovascular treatment for acute ischemic stroke in the Netherlands is the actual title, but that's Mr. Clean. It's published in some little journal in New England. And what it did was to show that endovascular treatment was beat medical treatment alone with those patients that were, were tested uh, 33 to 19 ended up with a modified Rankin scale score at 90 days of two or less. So these are patients who have independent function. That's what the, the scale score of two corresponds to or less. So you know, two, the, the lower the score, the better the function. So 33% of the patients who got both TPA, IV TPA, and endovascular uh, stent procedure had that score, achieved that score, that level of functioning as compared to 19. And when they compared the stroke volume with endovascular treatment, the stroke volume at day seven was 49 compared to 80. So it was almost half. And then after uh, Mr. Clean, the dominoes began to fall. We had multiple other strokes, uh, uh, sorry, studies, um, ESCAPE, Extend IA, uh, SWIFT Prime, and all of them showed the same results. And in fact, most of them uh, were stopped early because the results were just so overwhelming that they couldn't justify putting uh, patients in, in the other arm anymore. So a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, the results of Mr. Clean uh, triggered the suspension of the enrollment in a lot of these studies. <laughs>
So the, the results have been pretty overwhelmingly positive. Um, ESCAPE was a trial that uh, was in multiple countries, 22 sites. Again, published in that same little journal. And one of the most impressive uh, results of that study was that it showed that you only needed to treat four patients to have a benefit. You know, the, so the number needed to treat was four. That's amazingly small. That's less than the justification for giving aspirin to uh, heart attack patients. So um, it, it's really a powerful uh, result. And the same uh, with Extend IA showed that even uh, more impressive results that with the modified Rankin scale of two or less, the, oops. the uh, results were 71% versus 40% in the, the arm that included endovascular treatment compared to the arm that only included an IV TPA. And, you know, we, the same with, with SWIFT. We had uh, involved sites internationally, and all of these uh, studies showed that the earlier you um, achieve uh, TICI2B flow or, or flow reperfusion, basically, that the earlier you, you achieve reperfusion, the better the outcomes, the clinical outcomes were for these patients. So pretty amazing. And this is what we're hoping is our future. Uh, this is, you know, when, when you do endovascular uh, treatment for patients, and in addition to getting a, a plain CT scan, which is all we need to do to give IV TPA, they have to get either a CT angiogram or an MRI, and we're looking for a small area of infarction surrounded by a larger area of, of reduced perfusion, so that there's a penumbra of ischemia that is still available to be treated, um, but a small area of of infarction so that it's A, worth doing, and B, there's um, a minimal chance of bleeding. What um, is available now and we're looking to, to employ is a software called Rapid that allows you to get all of these images even on the phone of the, of the neurologist or, or um, in neurointerventionalist that shows the areas of infarction, so it'll show a small core, like here, and it'll show the area of perfusion, of decreased perfusion, but the area that you can actually do something about. So that would be the kind of patient that would be the primary type of patient that we would want to take um, and to, the, to the lab and, and have this type of intervention performed. So with uh, Mr. Clean, Escape, Extend IA, Swift Prime, they, we have level 1A evidence in over 1,000 patients that this is the treatment. It showed superiority of endovascular treatment compared to IVTPA alone. And it's now really the standard of care for those large vessel occlusions. So any patient that we have that comes into our primary care stroke center that has an NIH stroke scale of six or greater, um, if they are in the IV TPA window, we're giving IV TPA, and then we're sending them to Baptist to uh, be evaluated for, for uh, intervention. And certainly any of those patients that come in and also have a, a stroke scale of six or greater, but are outside the TPA window, we're doing the same thing. Because many of those patients that come in outside of the TPA window, it's not necessarily that they had their stroke six hours ago or eight hours ago, you know, or had their stroke outside the window. We just don't know when they had their stroke. So this is something that we're doing, particularly for those quote unquote wake up strokes, or what I like to call uh, strokes of unknown onset, because you know many of the stories are that patients, people come home and they say, oh, you know, I last saw my mother uh, at seven o'clock in the morning when I left the house. I'm coming back home at five o'clock, and now I find her, and she has this neurodeficit. It could have happened at four o'clock. 
she could still be well within the window to do something about, but we can't give her IVTPA because we don't know, because it could have happened at eight o'clock. And you know, then we're, we're risking um, a hemorrhage. So this has really opened our window for treating stroke in those patients that we don't know uh, what the onset of, of the deficit was when, when it happened, or those patients that wake up and you know, they went to bed at 10 o'clock at night, they wake up at six in the morning and who knows exactly when it happened. So I just wanted to give you some of the uh, clinical stories that um, have been cases, actual cases that we've taken care of. It's a 59-year-old woman, history of hypertension, diabetes, CHF, who was last known well at 2 a.m. that morning. She awoke around 6.30 a.m. with a right hemiplegia, facial droop, left gaze preference, and aphasia. Her NIH stroke scale is 22. She was outside the window for TPA, so that's exactly who we were talking about. She's got a little bit of clot here you can see. Tiny little, maybe decrease uh, 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 attenuation there that and it suggests maybe she's got a stroke. She had her angiogram, and lo and behold, you know, she's missing her MCA right there. And she had the perfusion images and a large area here of decreased flow. Um, they're um, putting in the wire here. Just the wire coming in. Again, the wire. They're opening up the stent, and we're getting reperfusion. And here's where they achieve the flow. TICI2B flow is that all of the arteries that you expect to, uh, to be there, you're able to see that they're getting reperfusion. 2B means that it's a little slower than you would expect, than normal, a little slower than normal, but, it, but it's getting perfused. And you know, she's got a smaller, she's got an area of infarction here, but it's much smaller than that whole area of the, the uh, penumbra that we saw. It's a 65-year-old man presenting with left hemiplegia, profound neglect, and I had stroke scale of 18, uh, he, and he arrived two hours and 30 minutes after symptom onset. He had a decreased level of consciousness. He was intubated for airway protection. He got IV TPA, and his angiogram started four hours after his symptoms. And whoa, his whole ICA is gone there. And again, that was one of the strongest predictors of mortality. So here's the wire and the catheter, the uh, stent. You've got reperfusion there. And he also had an MCA that was occluded. And they were able to go in and unocclude that as well. So that's after the, the internal carotid. And then here's the MCA. And they remove the clot from that, and there's reperfusion. And there are the clots, the two. And there's the man. So this is a couple of weeks later. 74-year-old man, sudden onset of left arm and left weakness with head and eyes deviated to the right and neglect. Arrived to the ED three hours after symptom onset, and I had stroke skill of 21. He was in the angio room four hours after. There's his internal carotid that's occluded. And the MCA. Here are the stents, the wire, and the stent. There's the clot. Just gets sucked out. This, I don't know if you can see very well. This is the stent here, and it's what was holding the clot. And 
get sucked out. The day after that, the patient had an NIH stroke scale of four, and you remember it was 22 on arrival, and a modified Rankin scale of one at 30 days, so he's back to functioning independently. So it makes a huge difference. 54-year-old man presenting with a right hemiplegia, aphasia, NIH stroke scale of 18, the top of the basilar artery occlusion on CTA. He didn't get IV TPA because of a recent STEMI. He was intubated, and his cerebral angiogram started four hours later. And I think you can see his stent coming up here, the wire coming here. This is the wire here. And he's, they had to pass twice, but after two passes, he was reperfused. He was extubated the next day with an NIH stroke scale of four, went home five days later. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, intracranial aneurysms, you know, the, uh, causing hemorrhagic strokes, because the treatment is pretty much the same thing when we have aneurysms, with the same procedure, the same endovascular operators, and the same basic, uh, this basically the same approach. So we've got a large aneurysm. Traditionally, the treatment was surgery with a, a craniotomy and a clipping, and now we can do endovascular embolization. So with that same catheter approach, they fill up the aneurysm with coil. Same approach here as, as the other endovascular procedure for stroke. And here's the coiling of the aneurysm. This was a patient, 66-year-old, and it actually should say a right hemi, hemiplegia, because you can see he's got uh, left-sided, uh, I'm sorry, he had right-sided um, uh, bleed, both intraparenchymal and subarachnoid from an, a large aneurysm. This was his aneurysm. Well, this was the aneurysm. This is the view there, large macular aneurysm, and here they're going up, locate the aneurysm, and they fill it up with the coil. And here's that man. So uh, the present is bright for patients with stroke. There's a lot that we're doing now with being aggressively treated with IV TPA. The question remains whether endovascular, uh, you know, all of the studies have compared IV TPA with IV TPA plus the uh, addition of the endovascular uh, therapy. And now the question is, well, do we need IV TPA at all for those large vessel strokes? Certainly those patients that come in with NIH stroke scales that are relatively low, um, they are going to need to get IV TPA. And certainly in places where uh, endovascular treatment is not available immediately uh, or within that six-hour window that the studies um, have been based on, they're going to need IV TPA as well. But we're looking at whether or not those patients that come in directly um, to a center that has this treatment available just should go directly to the lab. So that's what's coming. But even without that, with the aggressive treatment of IVTPA and the addition of the endovascular procedures that are treating those large vessel occlusions, that even when we gave TPA, those patients tended to deteriorate. Today is, is a good day, even for those patients with stroke. And endovascular treatment of brain aneurysms is a treatment of choice. It has a lower morbidity and mortality compared to traditional surgery. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm open to any questions. Uh, uh, Doc, you, you talked uh, about the, uh, the issue of time uh, in terms of the door to IV time, we're treating these patients who are, who are candidates for, with TPA. Is there any thought about extending that, uh, that TPA treatment outside the hospital 
uh, either a, a, at the site or doing, doing transport? Uh, any idea regarding having mobile stroke units that, that can start treatment even earlier? Uh, I think the limitation for a lot of, uh, and there has been, yes, to answer your question in brief, yes, there has been that thought. Um, and I think there are places where they're looking at having mobile CT units. But that's been the limitation for most places is you know, to have a CT scanner um, and then to have somebody who's able to, to read that, that CT has been, been the limitation. So, you know, in urban areas like where we are, uh, it's certainly much faster for the uh, rescue units to just bring the patients directly to um, the emergency department where, you know, all of that is available. But I think uh, in more rural areas where the transport time from uh, where the patient is to where the treatment is, then that is something that's going to, uh, need consideration. Thank you very much.